All right. Well, welcome back to the Biz Apps Classroom for a live on-site episode here from Dynamics Con 2024 in Denver, Colorado. I'm Jason Gumpert. I'm here with my co-host, Julie Yak. Hey, Julie. Hey, Jason. Are you loving Colorado? I'm loving Colorado. Yes. I'm so glad that we have a conference that's close to home. So I get to do all the conference stuff and then sleep in my own bed at night. Absolutely. So that's nice. And it feels good to go to a different city for a change um, on the conference circuit, you know. Um, it's, an, it's a great city. It's gorgeous and it's different. Yes. So we are here with our friend Nick. And I always make the mistake of assuming that everyone who listens knows people the way that I know people. <laughs> so I don't introduce people. So um, we have Nick Dolman here. He is a Boomerang MVP. So he was an MVP. He went blue badge. He came back as an MVP. And I'll just let Nick introduce himself. Hey, thanks, Julie. Hey, Jason. Nice to be here. Yeah, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nick Dolman. I am, I call myself now a power platform specialist, trainer, and coach. Uh, I'm an independent. Um, yeah, back is back of the MVP program. I'm also the co-host on my own podcast, the Power Platform Boost podcast, where we, every two weeks, I have a chat with my good friend Elika Ekerbeck from Norway, and we talk about all the new cool stuff in the Power Platform. And yeah, and I'm here at Dynamics Con <laughs> this week. I have a presentation tomorrow. And uh, yeah, excited to be here, talk about all the cool things that we do. So what are you presenting tomorrow? Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I am presenting um, the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Power Pages which is a, an evolution of a, a talk I've given multiple times. But of course, it is completely different than when I first started because there's new stuff, a lot of new co-pilot integration, things you can do. Um, and, you know, and it allows people to build pretty cool websites based on the Power Platform talking to Dataverse. So we're about two and a half minutes in and the first mention of co-pilot. That's, that's pretty fast. So we are seeing co-pilot and AI everywhere, right, Jason? Yeah, everywhere. And it's funny because having sat through just a few sessions at this event, you hear different presenters sort of trying to figure out how much or how little Copilot they want to talk about um, and then maybe get on to other things that, that they're maybe more interested to talk about. It, it really varies by speaker, but it's really on everyone's mind. And I think that sort of consciousness about how often it's it's discussed. And so that is just a great segue into the question that we are here to talk about is, will AI be replacing classroom training anytime soon? What do you think, Nick? I hope not, <laughs> to be quite honest. I think there is something about that human interaction that AI is just not bringing to the table. And if we look at the whole breadth of AI, we look at the the content it creates, we look at the artwork that people are trying to use AI to create and everything around that. And in terms of you know, even delivery of information. Like I've, some of you might have saw the new YouTube video about the chat GPT 4.0, which is mm -hmm. kind of yeah. actually talking to a pseudo AI generated person. Um, all exciting, but it's also, it's missing a human element, a soul or something to that. And I think that's what I'm really struggling with these days. It's sort of like, yes, I love the, the, the AI stuff that can automate, do those, those dummy tasks, those monkey tasks. Um, but I'm also not a big fan of the, the kind of the creative side. Like I think, uh, I, I think maybe Jason was talking to you or somebody about the, um, an email you could, someone could create an email, say, create me an email with these bullet points. And then it would create, um, an actual email. You'd send that email on the other end. Someone would say, Oh, give me a summary of this email back into bullet points. So these are sort of the, the crazy stuff we're seeing with Copilot. So I'm, I'm kind of going down a path and not really talk about the training side. I think definitely AI is interesting in the, the training side because I've done this. I need to learn. I need to ramp myself up on X. I'll go to chat GPT. I will say, I need to ramp myself up on this. Give me a breakdown, a learning plan, or give me a learning path. And it will generate one for me. Um, do I see that actually replacing classroom training? I don't know. There is something about experience that I think you can't get from an AI um, that you can get from a, a classroom to hear an instructor say, here's how you do something, but by the way, watch out for this, or we did it this way and it kind of run into trouble. Um, and as you're working through labs and things like that, there's just having that human element to it. What do you think, Julie? So I, like you, hope that we don't get replaced by AI, but... 
I'm seeing students bring AI into the conversation. We have our training cohorts. Um, we talked about our Ukrainian groups before where they have written assignments every week. And we can kind of tell when they've got an AI-generated response on the written assignments. So we turned it around. And in their first week of these brand new beginners, um, they're asked about digital transformation and how uh, can you overcome objections to digital tra transformation. And that's week one. In week six, we ask the same question, tell them to go ask the question of AI and see what AI tells them about digital transformation. But their actual assignment is tell me what's wrong with AI's response. Mm. And so that's another one of those human elements that you can't re replicate. Yeah, I mean, the other thing when it, in this sort of business application sphere, to me, these are complicated products and they're asking people to do, you know, complex things by and large, um, whether it's role-based or, uh, you know, manager level. So um, I think anyone who's, who thinks that AI can, you know, train people to do those kinds of things competently is probably, you know, fooling themselves. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the learning and the sort of psychology of what goes into it, as I'm sure you both know, is much deeper than that. It's much deeper than just asking a question and seeing something spit out about anything other than a sort of step-by-step, low-level kind of process, at least to me. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes to learning something new, Nick, what is your path to learning something new? Do you use AI as part of that? Yeah, I, I I would utilize AI as a tool. It was like yeah, it was interesting. A few months ago, I I really wanted to kind of go down into Bit Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. What's that about? How does it all work? Because it's sort of wrapping my head around the technology behind it. And then I started having this conversation with I think ChatGPT at the time and say, okay, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? But it was almost kind of doing the same thing I would have done with Google, doing searching on terms and that kind of thing. So. Yes, I would use AI to learn new things, but more from a don't tell me all about it, have that use it as a tool, a research tool to find out different things. And that's why I like some of these um, tools. I think uh, the, the Microsoft 365 Copilot that gives the references. I think ChatGPT does it now as, as well. Give me the references so it's not just you making, <laughs> you Copilot making up stuff that I got to take at face value. So, that's part of how I will learn things. For me, the biggest thing, I learn best when I have a problem that I need to solve. And really, it's about monkeying around and trying to get things to work. And then, yes, I will, again, I won't just tell Copilot, tell me how to do it because it does not tell me a very good way I've been noticing, like trying to figure out a piece of code or trying to figure out a solution. Um, for instance, the other day I said, write me some power effects that will do blah, blah, blah. And it gave me some code, which I know will not work because it was embedding some things in one of the for alls or whatever. And so I kind of sighed. Okay. Okay. Copilot. I can't do this function within the for all. How do I do it without? And of course it came back. Oh, certainly. Yeah, you're right. You can't do that. Well, you should have known this. It's sort of anyways. And then, uh, so rewrite me the code and it did. And it had the same problem <laughs> in that code. So you got to, you still got to know what you're doing. It definitely has helped because I have solved problems using Copilot in that context to help me learn. But like everything else, it's a tool. It's a research tool. It's like, it's like pulling a book off a library shelf. It's doing a Google search. It's now kind of, now we're tapping into a little bit of this uh, and just another way to get information and sometimes a little bit faster. Um, but this time... I think I'm having trust issues of what's coming back because I'm seeing mistakes that are pretty obvious. So that kind of builds a, okay, is it really how it is? And again, that's like I said before, going back to those references. One, one thing that occurs, occurred to me just today, because I, I think I, I've been sitting in on some FNO focus sessions, but I also saw the customer service roadmap uh, presentation earlier today. And there's a lot of co-pilot in customer service roles that's coming out, if it's not out already, helping sort of summarize issues or suggest responses to cases, things like that. And, you know, one of the, I guess, the risks I foresee um, is that uh, agents will not really check them, right? That they will just say, oh, that looks like, that looks pretty good with the, what Copilot spit out for me. I'll just send that, I'll just send that suggestion over, not check it, and there's garbage in it, perhaps. And, you know, if you have a five, if you have hundreds or thousands of agents, 
you know, on chat or on phone, uh, maybe you are going to get, uh, you run that risk of getting too much, uh, you know, garbage, uh, garbage coming back to the customer if you don't, if you don't train them properly. Well, and we've seen some new functionality coming out where you can take uh, the case notes from a re- resolved case and create a knowledge base article. I would really love if I could say take these five resolve cases and make a knowledge base article because then perhaps it can give a more detailed, thorough, intelligent response instead of just based on a single case that feels very short sighted. Yeah, that's a great point because um, I've seen, you know, asking, especially around the power platform, asking questions, you know, trying to learn something and then looking, like I said, back the references, the references are going to the community forums and don't get me wrong, I have learned a lot of good tidbits and have had questions answered on the community forums. I've answered questions on the community forums. I have also gone in and corrected <laughs> answers on the community forum going, no, 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 don't do it this way because of this, or this is the right way to do it. You know, obviously a little bit more friendlier than that. And now if Copilot is relying on that as a source of information, that to me brings up all sorts of red flags and again, trust issues on that kind of stuff. So I like that what you said, Julie, about, yes, create me a knowledge base article on these five resolved cases because we know that that's where the resolution lies as opposed to, well, try this, try that. And, oh, this is the way to do it when clearly it's not. Yeah, I can imagine like a single case with some sort of curious, you know, journey to find the final answer. And it reads through like, you know, five failed attempts to solve the problem. And the sixth one fixes it. And they're like, oh, well, this must be the six steps you go through to solve this, <laughs> solve this issue. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. What about um, when, with training, with, with developing training, I should say, the usage of Copilot? I think we're sort of touching on that already. But like, you know, with these tools that are going to be standard in, this, in the products, right? Uh, do you foresee that as training creators or, or trainers? Yeah, yeah. And here's a, a bit of confession time. Actually, <laughs> um, there was actually I was a, I was approached by an uh, it was actually an organization. They wanted Power Apps training and Power Automate training. They did not have premium licenses. They have we have just the straight up Microsoft 365 licenses what kind of training can you do? And I'm like, okay. So I actually, I, you know, it was kind of a quick turnaround. What, what can we do? So I actually asked chat GPT, give me a high level curriculum, power apps, power automate, um, without use, using the M365 kind of thing. And it spat back a syllabus, um, which was actually not too bad. So I was able to go in, I cleaned it up, I edited it out and send it off to the, 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 the customer. And they were like, yes, this is exactly what we want. Great. You know, this, you know, you're on top of it. Like, like, Oh, okay. This is, this is dangerous because I don't want to start relying on that. Like still, I wouldn't have just generated it and sent it, but I could see how someone would be tempted to do that. Like I read through and made sure it made sense to me, but it did save me probably an hour or two to try to put that together myself. So there is, in terms of content creation, definitely um, in terms of, you know, maybe putting together labs or putting together presentations, you know, there's going to be a bit of a flip to writing stuff on a blank page versus having stuff written for you and spending more time editing and revising that. And then I think that's going to be the interesting breakdown of, are you going to spend less time revising editing than you would have creating revising editing. And I'm not quite sure if we're completely there yet. I don't know, Julie, maybe you have some insights. Well, I've used Copilot to help with bridging gaps. So if I'm making a conference session and as a conference speaker, we will submit talks that we haven't made yet, just in the hopes that they'll get selected. And so great, it gets selected, I will feed that description to Copilot and ask for an outline of this session and then evaluate it for, yes, this is a good idea. No, I would do it in this order instead and using it to bridge those gaps. Or if I know I want to speak on a certain topic and I'm just stalling intellectually, I can't get past a barrier and I need some help with speaker notes, I will kind of give that random word salad into Copilot and ask for more coherent thoughts in return to help bridging those gaps. Yeah, I think one thing we 
talked about, I think it was on our last episode where we were using, where you were sort of using Copilot was, um, I, I did like that it was able to, it, it uses concise language, um, most of the time, which is something that people just who are writing struggle with, right? They, um, can be a little circuitous and it takes a couple of revisions. And so that is definitely a positive, especially if you're trying to, you know, show something to someone else, um, that, that, that's been written, um, but I think uh, what was my what was my other related point to that? Uh, maybe related to prompts um, and I guess training people or, or helping people get the because I think one of the directions that this is kind of taking Power Platform and, and Dynamics customers is toward using this more right, like using using Copilot in lieu of kind of standard picking and clicking through the interface right. And so I just I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on where that's going in terms of like? where people know to use use copilot effectively within the context of an app versus the traditional ways of doing things yeah and i think it's still a skill set like think about before we had computers or before we had gps you needed to give someone instructions on how to get to your house um so you'd be go up this road turn here take this roundabout watch out for this bump in the road like and you still and i, and I don't know if you remember like some people were very good at giving distort directions other people, not so much because they would forget steps or whatever, or they would like, oh, you know, it just, we kind of a little bit mumbled up and you'd end up getting lost. So I think prompting is that skill as well, but it still requires a skill to get your thoughts together, get things articulated, to get your prompting right, to be able to create what it is you're creating or what it is you're configuring. So we're shifting, there's still parts of our brain that we're still tapping into, but now we're accessing a different part. And the great thing about the co-pilot is, or the hope is, it's going to take, it's going to fill in some of those gaps or be able to get the syntax right and kind of sometimes eliminate those. Why isn't my code working? Well, it's because I had a semicolon there that I didn't see for the last two hours when I'm trying to debug this. So that's just, you know, we still need those skills. And then the code it generates, we still need to make sure that's exactly what we want it to create, I think. So that's how I see some of this going as well. We still need like prompting at the end of the day, it's the prompting skills. And that is something that I've also read and tried to teach myself. And I got a bunch of these formulas and things I try out with much better results than I think when we all got chat GPT and started typing in random stuff. Well, I think one of the most important things to keep in mind about writing prompts is you have to have some idea, some context of the expected response in order to craft the appropriate prompt for whatever AI you're talking to, that you can't just go into it blind. You have to have some kind of idea of what you're going to get on the other side. Um, and going back to those directions, Nick, I live on an unmarked dirt road on the side of a mountain. So yeah, people need good directions. <laughs> yeah, I remember I used to get you know that kind of directions and I would pull out my book, of my map book, and see if I could line it up or, or you know, a fold up map and see if I could like line up the instructions. And yeah, you, you could definitely grade them on how how effective they were because sometimes it was totally off or just guessing. I was making a presentation and talking about grounding data and how, you know, sometimes you hear people talking about, oh, well, you turn right where that red barn used to be, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that person who's giving the directions is last year's GPT because that's the information they have. Um, but then suddenly I'm being grounded with the data of where the barn used to be. So now I've been brought up to speed. Yeah. So one of the other things that we talked about, well, we you gave me a great list of things that we could talk about here. But one of the other ones that we talked about was learning by teaching. Mm. So this is not really a very spectacular segue, but I think it's important to talk about different ways people learn. And I really like the idea of learning by teaching. Can you give us a little bit more about yeah, that? appropriate at a conference where some people do challenge themselves to get in front of an audience and... Yeah, well, that's that you said about doing sessions. It's like, oh, well, I'm going to do a session. Like, oh, it'd be interesting if someone who did a session or I'd, I'd put it a session pitch on something and it'd be something like all of a sudden, like, shoot, now it got picked. Now I got to wrap myself up real quick. Um, but yeah, I've done that for like for training before. Like I always like any training that I deliver, I want to make sure at least I have some experience with the like real world experience with the product. I, I'm not all that comfortable teaching something that I've had no experience with. And I know I get pinged on LinkedIn and say, yo, hey, can you deliver a course on like um, Dynamics Business Central? Like, 
And I'm like, no, I can't because I don't know it. Um, but within the power platform, I mean, coming from a CRM world where 15, 20 years ago, we could know everything there is to know about CRM. It was very, very narrow focus. Can't do that anymore. But a lot of with these training courses, like you even look at the Microsoft official curriculum, the PL 200s or 600s, there are areas, there are modules that I haven't had a lot of experience in. So I've have to dive in, try the labs, go through it and at least get a good experience. Maybe read some blogs from the other people in the community to get ramped up. And then all of a sudden, yeah, I've learned something. And it's the fact that I've had to now explain it to someone else really sticks with me as an instructor. Um, so it's kind of like double learning. I've learned it and now I've transferred that on. So yeah, I, to me, it's, I've learned so much by some of the courses I've had to teach because all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, here's this curriculum and well, here's this gap that I've not had experience with it. So, you know, in my head, get ramped up on this, Nick, because you don't want to be stumped by questions as well. Yeah, that pressure can really help sort of, <laughs> yeah. uh, similar to like being, having to get something accomplished and having to read the help or whatever. Yeah. So what else are you looking forward to while we're here at this conference? Do you have sessions to deliver, Nick, or are you already done? No, I have one session tomorrow. We talked about four on Power Pages. Um, and I'm after this, I'm going to the, I guess, expert section or whatever. So talk about maybe being stumped by questions because there's a lot of business central FNO people rumbling around here. So, um, and my GP knowledge is now 15, 20 years old. So like shrink, rebuild, check links. I don't know if that's a thing anymore. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's that's You'll it. Still and find some GP people though. Oh, for we're, sure. We're oh yeah, yeah. To talk GP. So. Oh yeah, you yeah. know it. Yeah. Oh, I, I know. It's, <laughs> a, a Great Plains is that old, reliable piece of farm equipment that's twenty years old, but just works. Why would you change it? Um, so that's that's about it. Of course, meeting up with people in the community, which I always love doing. Um, trying to pick up a few tidbits of knowledge here and there. Um, yeah, and if, yeah, it's just it's really cool. I mean, for me, the community is what um, has helped my career um, and. It's just good to kind of share all that. And so that's, yeah, what I'm looking for, like pretty much every conference. So I will tell you that the experts area, each table is marked for the technology family. So just sit at the right table and hopefully you'll just get the right questions. Or for a, a fun thrill, sit at the wrong table. <laughs> <laughs> that would be perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Nick. I really appreciate the time today and I'm glad that you had a chance to be a guest on our podcast. Yeah, thanks, Nick. It was fun talking. Yep, thank you. And I uh, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity.